Puerto. I am the academic uh, dean of this campus of EDP University of Puerto Rico. It is my pleasure to share with you this moment. Um, I would like to extend again a warm welcome greeting to everyone and present this afternoon our uh, presentations. This is my Spanglish talking in my head. Um, I want to let you know that we are transmitting this event through our uh, EDP channels, Facebook, Facebook Live and YouTube. So let's say hi to the people in the other side. Hi everyone. Okay. It is my pleasure to present in this moment our president, our esteemed president, Mrs. Gladys Nieves, uh, to make the formal greeting to the audience. Good afternoon. So here we are again. Um, my name is Gladys Nieves. I'm the president of EDP University of Puerto Rico. I'm also the daughter of the founders, uh, Gladys and Aníbal Nieves Nieves. And we also have uh, four more campuses, five more campuses actually. The, our second campus is in San Sebastián. San Sebastián is a town that has a name and a last name. Has a first name and a last name. It's called San Sebastián de Las Vegas del Pepino. <laughs> and our, our colleague from, from the American Heart Association, her parents were born in San Sebastián, and her mother went to school in what used to be EDP College of Puerto Rico. So EDP University is, has been founded for 55 years. And we are proud to be now the chair of the board of heads. So I was. <laughs> so I went to. I went to Medellin, and that's when they were they elected me uh, chair of the board, and I needed to have uh, a glimpse of what you are are, are experiencing. So I took five students. Uh, uh, we have never been outside of the United States for these board meetings. This was the first time that we were in Medellin, Colombia. So I took five students and four uh, faculty members with me, and we spent a whole week. We were supposed to, I was there for two, two days, and, and the Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia. We also have two members from the Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia. Please say hi. They received us, they prepared an excellent uh, cultural experience with us. All, obviously, we did what we had to do over there, which was the board meeting, but the students had a blast. And uh, also, it's very important that you know that in Puerto Rico, I probably you already have noticed, in Puerto Rico, the language of instruction is mainly Spanish. We teach English as a second language, but we encourage our students to do some conversational English and practice their, their careers or their vocabulary in English because we certainly are part of the United States and we need to move back and forth. So it's very important for me to have this first uh, student passport. ¿Cómo se llama? Connect, lead, and learn. Connect, lead, and learn in our beautiful Puerto Rico. Uh, we also house the, the headquarters of HEADS. Obviously, HEADS was originally uh, a project from a, a, a proposal in Ana, in Ana Jiménez, and it turned into an organization with membership and with dues and, and everything. But the principal part of this uh, consortium was basically to serve Hispanic uh, students in a bilingual environment and to connect 
within institutions so that we can collaborate. So uh, in order for us to collaborate, we need to meet, we need to know each other, we need to trust each other. So this is, uh, this is my project uh, for us to understand not only the presidents who are in the board meetings, to understand what do you do in your respective institutions. So today we have uh, students, obviously, uh, leaders from each, uh, each campus, but also we have administrators who are going to be uh, looking for uh, collaborations. In, when Dr. Vargas was the, the chair of the board, he came to a meeting with a lot of people from his, from his uh, university. And he met with different universities. While we were over there doing the, our board meeting, he had a lot of people going to the different uh, organizations. In that, uh, in that meeting, when they came to EDP University, I didn't know, I, they th I thought that they were gonna have entrepreneurship or different uh, technologies, and they ended up doing a, a collaboration with the fashion, digital fashion design program. So we have now, we have a, a program where a, our next speaker, he's, he, he, uh, he was one of the persons who went to, uh, as, a, as an exchange student, to the Southeastern Missouri University. So this is just an example of what we can do. It, I mean, the sky is the limit. So thank you for coming to Puerto Rico and welcome to EDP University. Thank you, President Nieves. Um, I want to recognize two important persons within our academic community. Um, one of them is Dr. Pablo Rodriguez. What is Dr. Pablo? Is the director of our graduate school and also our renowned fashion designer, regionally and internationally renowned, uh, Professor Lisa Ton. She is the director of our design school. Now, Professor uh, Tong will present two distinguished students from San Sebastian campus, uh, from EDP San Sebastian campus, Alberto Acevedo and Yarelis Gomez. We will present about fabrics, fashion, sustainability, and culture. So, let's get Good afternoon. Although my last name is from Germany, I was born in Puerto Rico, raised in Puerto Rico, and my first language is still Spanish. So um, I will be having two of our best known and talented students from the San Sebastian campus. One of them, as the, our president told us before, he had the opportunity to be an exchange student to CIMO, a Southeast Missouri University. And he will be maybe competing real soon in a reality show here in Puerto Rico too, as a fashion designer. So he's one of our upcoming talent um, young students. Alberto Acevedo and Yarielis Guzman from our campus in San Sebastian will be telling you about their experience. Um, they, the experience they had a couple of months ago traveling to Medellin, Colombia and being able to learn a lot, not only from their food, their culture, but also the fashion industry. So welcome. You're more than welcome to come here and join me. And I will leave this to Alberto. He will be um, speaking to you in English. And Yarelis will be also in Spanish, adding some important information. So welcome. Well, hello everyone. As you all heard, my name is Alberto. I am a fashion design student at EDP University. I would like to show gratitude to Lisa Ton for that incredible introduction. And I'm here with my colleague, Jarelis Guzman. Hey everyone, I'm Jarelis Guzman. And I enjoy, I hope I enjoy this. <laughs> so today we'll be, we will be sharing our lovely experience visiting Medellin, Colombia.
So as soon as we arrived to Colombia, we were greeted by Ruby and Clarena, who were essentially our tour guides. And as soon as we left the airport, uh, our journey began. We took a 40 to 50 minute drive, which allowed us to take the, our first glimpse of Colombia's beautiful sceneries and breathtaking artwork. Este viaje empezó desde que nos recogieron en el aeropuerto, fue una experiencia inolvidable. Nos recibieron con un cálido abrazo y una, eh, una alegría sin igual. Y de ahí partimos a un gran restaurante llamado El Matriarca. La Matriarca. <risa> el cual fue un bombazo, como decimos acá en Puerto Rico. Fue muy al estilo Puerto Rico, pero al mismo tiempo nos dieron esa, ese cálido abrazo de Colombia. So at La Madriarca, we had live music, they had a soccer game playing, so we got the full Colombian experience. On our second day, it mostly consisted of visiting various uh, textile production factories. So we were able to visit the facilities, learn about different production techniques, as well as ways in which they minimize their waste products. En nuestro primer día nos levantamos lleno de emoción para visitar ciertas fábricas y ciertas tiendas de textiles, lo cual nos, nos dieron una experiencia inolvidable. Y nos enseñaron un poquito más sobre cómo Colombia es muy eco-friendly con el ambiente y con la gente. Por eso es que una vez tú llegas a Colombia sientes ese cálido abrazo. So our first stop was Fabricato. Fabricato is a factory that mostly focuses on creating eco-friendly products. Their fibers are made by collecting pre- and post-consumption recovered fibers. They use hemp, cotton, nylon, and even pineapple. En nuestra primera fábrica, Fabricato, llamada también, nos enseñaron cómo desde su origen hasta su producto final, el cual conllevaba de distintas plantas, tanto el algodón, la piña, entre otras que nos enseñaron, También nos enseñaron productos que nos ayudaron a nosotros de diseño de moda a establecer y ser un poquito más, como ya mencionado, eco-friendly. These are some pictures from Fabricato. They, they're also really big in their trend research. So they had on display upcoming print trends for spring summer 2025 as well as color trends for spring summer 2025. Yes. So right after, we also visited Expo Faro. Expo Faro is a factory that also focuses on sustainability. However, their products are mainly made out of denim. So at Expo Faro, they actually have a reservoir, which allows them to filter their water, removing any indigo and other contaminants, uh, avoiding them, you know, to contaminate the environment. Después de Fabricato, nos dirigimos especialmente a Expo Faro, en el cual, una vez entras, te da un cálido bienvenido por su gran exposición de arte en cada lugar, en cada rincón que se puede ver. Algunas imágenes presentadas también van a poder apreciar eso. También, ellos se, conect, se concentran mayormente en lo que es el tenis, la ropa maón, como nosotros también le decimos. Bueno, <risa> adicional, como mi compañero aquí estaba diciendo, para aquellas personas que no entienden el inglés, ellos purifican la agua que ellos utilizan para no hacer tanto daño, como ellos saben que las fábricas hacen bastante daño al medio ambiente, y así hacen una recolecta que evitan la contaminación. So after Expo Faro, we also visited Sutex. Now Sutex is mostly focused on creating polyester fabrics. They recover plastic, select them, crush them, create thread, and set thread is used to create the fabrics. Out of 12 bo water bottles, you can actually get a whole meter of polyester fabric. Una vez nos retiramos de las fábricas, procedimos a ir a una tienda de textiles, la cual también nos especificó cómo su producción se trata en reciclar y a coger esas pequeñas botellas de agua y pasar por un cierto proceso para convertir en los textiles que ellos manejan. So that leads us to our third day. Our third day was mostly focused on meeting brand owners, designers, ateliers, and we also visited Jardín de los Silleteros. Our first brand is called Tejidos Palay. Tejidos Palay is an interdisciplinary group made up of women weavers. They actually use um, 
techniques that they've gathered from generations and generations and you know they manage to create fashion using these techniques so it's more of like an um artisan brand en tejidos palay es una corporación artesanal la cual tuvo la amabilidad de enseñarnos un poco de su proceso y nos también nos compartieron algunas técnicas que practicamos allí mismo y fue una experiencia inolvidable sin más, también nos compartieron sobre un pequeño picnic que estuvo súper nice, súper delicado, en el cual pudimos comer un poquito sobre lo que es la comida típica de Colombia. At said picnic, we also managed to bond over uh, not only the cultural differences, but also finding ways in which we can connect, ways that we are similar. And, you know, it was a beautiful mutual cultural exchange. So we also visited Jardín de los Silleteros, and a fun fact about Colombia is that Colombia is one of the world's biggest exporters of beautiful flowers. They celebrate an annual parade, which is called Medellín Flower Festival, in which silleteros get to proudly show off their beautiful floral arrangements. And silleteros are essentially floral vendors. En el Jardín de los Silleteros pudimos profundizar un poco más en la cultura. En cómo la cultura de los tiempos de antes ha pasado de generación en generación hasta lo que conocemos hoy en día. Lo cual es un punto muy curioso porque muchas, muchas culturas se llegan a perder al paso del tiempo. Y eso es muy triste, pero ellos siguen manteniendo viva esa experiencia. Y de verdad que les exhorto a visitar ese lugar. So these are just some pictures. Now, talking about the different brands, we got to know Alado and Company. Alados whole thing is that they balance fashion with artisanal practices and their reference is usually plastic arts. Tuvimos el placer de visitar distintas tiendas, distintas marcas reconocidas, ejemplo fue Alado, que también nos pudo compartir un poquito más sobre su origen, sobre cómo ha pasado por ciertos procesos y que ha llegado a convertirse en lo que es hoy en día. We also managed to know Arcano. The brand owner of Arcano is actually friends with the owner of Tejidos Palay. And she also focuses on visiting different rural places and giving an exposure to these people's um, techniques that they otherwise wouldn't be able to have. Una vez finalizamos así, fuimos a distintas tiendas, como mi compañero aquí ya habló. Cada una, si usted puede fijar, tiene su área, tiene su técnica, tiene su origen, como ya mencionado. Y es muy bonito cómo ver desde una persona, porque una sola voz puede hacer mucho escala. Aunque uno no lo so, on our fourth day, it was mostly a business day. We visited Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia, which we have two people here representing. Uh, yeah. A special shout out. Thank you for your hospitality. So at Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia, we managed to take place, take part of a podcast segment, a video segment. They have a lot of green spaces around campus to feel grounded, nourished. We also had a brief class with Professor Paulo Cantillo about the importance of having a brand and all of the important factors that surround, surround it. And this would be a brand called Matelsa. It's a brand from Colombia. Um, they are focused on well-being, confidence, and high performance. They, their products are usually activewear and streetwear. And their pillars are community, healthy diet, rest, physical activity, meditation, leisure, environment, knowledge, and purpose. In esta universidad, muchas gracias por la invitación, fue una universidad que nos captó desde el inicio, ya gracias a su estructura como tal, hacer eco-friendly y nuestra, la oportunidad que nos dieron de estar en el podcast, las entrevistas que nos hicieron, como tal fue todo exquisito. So on our fifth day we visited another university which is called Universidad Pontificana, Pontificia Bolivar, Bolivariana, sorry. They offer classes for costume design, marroquinería, which translates to leather goods. They had a lot of green spaces, we obviously had to leave our stamp. We also visited a fabric store, and uh, they have really high quality materials that otherwise we wouldn't be able to find here in Puerto Rico. So it was really lovely to see them and purchase them as well. 
Let's see some pictures. Nosotros visitamos, lo que ya muchos de ustedes deben haber escuchado, la Comuna 13. La Comuna 13 fue mayormente un viaje cultural y turístico, pero también pudimos a, aparentar y pudimos explorar un poquito sobre los tejidos, sobre las técnicas de allá y sobre el público que vive en Colombia. So, Comuna, Comuna 13 actually used to be one of the most dangerous areas in Medellín. However, with the help of community projects and a series of outdoor um, escalators, they really like transformed it. And right after we just went on the metro cable, and sadly day six was back to reality. So in behalf of my classmates and myself, I would like to thank Lisa Thong, Engineer Gladys Nieves, the Gets Organization for having us today, and EDP University as well. Finalmente, agradecer a la facultad y a los de Gets. También ustedes también hay que, hay que reconocerles sobre ese apoyo que hemos, eh, nos dieron. Y que de verdad, gracias, estamos más que agradecidos y esperemos que muchos estudiantes puedan tener esta oportunidad y puedan explorar un poquito más sobre esto. Y no tan solo en Colombia, sino visitar, que esos estudiantes de otros extranjeros como ustedes puedan visitar aquí a Puerto Rico, a esta gran universidad que ha apoyado a demasiados estudiantes a seguir adelante. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Did you, uh, did anybody say anything about a solution for clothing that people don't want anymore in terms of what they're doing? We didn't really touch that topic actually. However, they do focus on using um, upcycled materials, recovering fabrics, you know, giving those pieces a second life and a second opportunity. Which they are doing actually um, very good in Medellin, Colombia, but also we're practicing in Puerto Rico all our classes. And I want to welcome also Carmen Peña, who is the fashion specialist of the San Sebastian campus. We are great. We are develop, developing a lot of awareness in in charge of our, you know, through our students in projects in different courses where they have to realize, you know, that. Um, the world is not going to be as it is right now for the rest, you know, of the ones that are going to live after us. And upcycling, as Alberto mentioned, is uh, the way to like all the leftovers that of clothing that we don't use anymore could be either redesigned and used as more advanced and um, high quality items, or it could be developed into new fabrics too. So they're doing that as students, and we want them to practice as professionals too. Any other questions? Yes, I have one. So, first, I want to let you know that I have admired your work for a very long time. I love your creativity, and I hope you get as many opportunities open to you because you definitely deserve them. So, my question is, what brought you to creative design, and what made you go through that eco-friendly route well, in terms of creative design, I've self-expression is something that I've always held close to my heart, and that's why I love fashion. Uh, and in terms of eco-friendly, I mean, we live in this world once, and if we don't take care of, him, of it, who will? You know. And I've managed to um, create pieces using upcycle techniques, using denim, and it's very fun. Um, so yeah, I, I truly hope that we can create a general consciousness and everyone, you know, starts take, partaking into these practices. This was made by her. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for that answer. And honestly, I hope that for the both of you, 
for both designers, you guys get all of the opportunities that you deserve because we definitely need that impact in this world. As a beauty queen myself with an eco-friendly project promoting what holistics are and an eco-friendly way of living, I love seeing that the youth aligns with that. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, I have the pleasure to present Mr. Ralph Figueroa from California State University. He will speak about telehealth and veterans front end, right? Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good afternoon. Uh, you guys could do better than that. Good afternoon. So uh, real quick, I know we just ate. Let's everybody stand up real quick. Just shake it off. Shake it off. Let's, all that food, let's shake it all down. Come on. Give, let's give it a good ah. Let me hear it. Let me hear it. Ah. There we go. All right. Let's all take a seat. Today, I will be speaking on uh, telehealth and the Veterans Roundtable. Um, I am a U.S. Army veteran. My name is Ralph Figueroa. Um, my mom is from Mexico. She's from Mexico. Uh, my dad from El Salvador, El Salvadoreño. I joined the army and I somehow became a Puerto Rican. I don't know how that works, but I embraced it. I loved it. And when they called me Papi, I was like, "Yep, I'm down. I'm down with this." The reason why this is so important is because we're going to focus on enhancing student veterans and their opportunities within the college education by using technology. So we'll start with the slides here. So I'm a third year student, I'm a graduate student. I'm gonna graduate in spring of 2025 with my rehabilitation counseling masters and a certificate for rehabilitation counseling. And my focus is to work with veterans with disabilities. Um, it's, it's important that we make sure that their, their health, not only their physical, but their mental health is also taken care of. So uh, one thing that we've been focusing on is using telehealth. So what's on the agenda today? What is telehealth? Um, it's the use of digital technology uh, that provides remote uh, health care. So we've been using it since the pandemic, right? We, 2020, the world shut down, and it actually created a good thing because now we started using telehealth. So our doctors were like, hey, don't get us sick, right? We started wearing masks. So instead, we decided to like, hey, let's, and they started introducing different platforms, whether it's through Zoom, whether it's through Teams. There's so many different platforms, different applications. Um, today, we're going to focus on the unique needs of veterans. We're going to talk about the role of telehealth and how we're helping our veterans. Um, and then the initiative called the, the Veterans Roundtable. Um, I'm going to share some success stories of what we've created on our campus and the future direction of where we're going to go with telehealth and the Veterans Roundtable. And lastly, we're going to do a call to action. So one thing that's important to understand and if I just put a quick question are there any are there any military veterans here present aside from myself if there's any none here so so there are especially in Puerto Rico there's a lot of veterans like they I, I was stationed in Fort Sill Oklahoma and I'm from California so when I get to Oklahoma I, I met a I met a sergeant who had the same last name as I did was Figueroa and he thought I was from Puerto Rico and so he he embraced me and so what what I understand right there was the, the beauty about what the military does already is DEI is already part of it, right? We talk about diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And the, the military already has that. That diversity, it doesn't matter what color you are, what religion, what you identify as. The diversity is already there. The equitable value that we have in the military is we all serve our country. We, say we wear the same uniform, and then we're inclusive of everybody, right? We're taking that same idea into our academic settings in the university. But understanding what our student veterans are coming with, right? We understand that there's a transitional period, just like most of us here, right? Transitioning into school, right? That was like a little bit of like, remember that first day as a freshman coming into a university and you're like, what the hell am I doing here, right? You, you almost want to cry, you get nervous. It's like, there's so much thing. Veterans come from the, the, the military where they're being told what to do and now they got to make decisions for themselves. So they're lost. And this happens multiple times. I myself transitioned between in and out of the military into civilian life, into academic life, at least seven or eight times. So I got pretty good at it. 
Um, there's also an understanding about their physical challenges. They're coming back with um, a lot of physical disabilities. And also, as we've seen, um, you know, mental health is one of those things that we're, we're really focusing on, right? We know that these veterans are coming back with PTSD. They're coming back with anxiety, depression. Um, some have traumatic brain injuries. And it, it's, it's just all just crazy for them. The, the, the world is, is out of place. Um, but it's also important to understand that not only that, they come with issues that don't even pertain to any of that stuff. That's just basic needs, housing, transportation. Um, we're even talking about food insecurities. And last but not least, I'm going to also mention about language. So in the military, we have our own unique language. So I was in the Army, so we always say, huh. That was our thing. So if you ever hear somebody say, huh, that means they're in the Army, right? If they say, hoorah. Anybody ever heard that one before? If anybody's seen Scent of a Woman, right? Remember, he kept saying, hoorah, hoorah. He's a Marine. I did that when I drank too much tequila. I went right into the toilet, hoorah. Did, that's when I do it. But it's important to understand, all too, that the student veterans are coming back with some awesome qualities, too. They're coming in with leadership skills. They're mission-oriented. There's integrity. There's courage. So it's, it's, it's a give and take. And at our university, we're really focusing on how telehealth is supporting veterans. And this supports not just student veterans, but veterans in general, which means that they're offering virtual support. That means that we can go through, like I said, we can get counseling um, and also health care. So our doctors through the VA system, Veterans Affair, they're able to communicate with us. And the reason why this is so important, this is one of the, the many benefits of telehealth, is it gives us accessibility. Right? Who doesn't want to have access to being able to talk to your doctor? In the past, when you made an appointment at the VA, you had to wait months. What if I need health care now? What if I need mental health care now? Right? We need that ASAP. So, so we have accessibility. It's flexible. Right? Now it's, it's, it's at any time of the day. We can take a break. Sometimes they do it from their car. Um, it also reduces stigma. Right? As the, the veterans are proud, they're, they're strong and the moment of that momentary weakness, it's hard for us to swallow that, that pride. But also, what, what telehealth does, it also makes it more inclusive, right? Now they're bringing us into the safe space of virtual reality, right? And now we're in the space with other people. And that's something that's unique that we created over at, at our university. So this is, this is what we call the Veterans Roundtable Initiative, right? So this is the model we created through my master's program. So there was... Uh, an internship opportunity and instead of going to the direction that my program usually sends us to my professor challenged me and says you do your own practicum because you don't want to listen to us and I was like no I don't want to I don't want to work where you're trying to send me I want to work with veterans so she challenged me and this is what we came up with so this is our veterans roundtable and as you can see the safe space is that big house looking thing right that's it could be a veteran center it could be just a, a, this could be a safe space right as long as it's closed up, and this, one thing that we focus on is veteran only. A veteran can't talk to a civilian there and vice versa. So we share this space together. And if you can see in the diagram right in the middle, the veterans round table is right in the middle. And we're, we're, we're all sitting around it. The two parts that make it unique is there's a facilitator who is an intern, which can be through a psychology degree, a master's program. We're looking for master's level internships. Uh, we're also looking at... Uh, through my program or masters in social work. But then also we add that extra component of tying into our counseling and psychological services at our campuses and have them present. Now here's the beauty about this model. One of those two facilitators has to be the veteran. If they're both, even better, but one of them has to be the veteran. And the beauty about how telehealth works, you see that arrow and that student veteran is at his home or her home. Guess what, they can still join in with us so we have students at our university, we have two campuses, one in San Bernardino, one in, in the Palm Desert area, which is roughly about a little over an hour away. And they can't make it to a meeting. That's too much. Gas, gas is expensive over in California. I don't know if you guys knew that. It's very expensive. But guess what? Now they feel included by being part of our group. So this is what, what we're, we've been focused on this for over a year, not realizing this is something that's not being done. The Veterans Roundtable created so many success stories, and I'll share two of them with you today. Uh, first, there's Vicky. She's an Army veteran. She's a computer engineering uh, uh, major right now. She's a senior. She's about to graduate in the spring. She got a huge $10,000 STEM scholarship. But the, the important thing of what she, when she gained from the Veterans Roundtable, she got camaraderie, and she was very quiet. Vicky was kind of an introvert. 
So she, look at, you know, she, we had these awards on campus. She wound up winning the emerging leader. That was a huge, now they're seeing her and now she's, she's brave. She's like, I'm out there. I want to talk to you in front of people. Lucy was probably the one that impacted me the most. Air Force veteran, just graduated this spring. She's from the Palm Desert campus, an hour away. And she one time told us, she says, hey, how come, Ralph, how come we don't have feminine hygiene products at our center? And I'm like, well, I'm a guy. I never think about hygiene products, right? It's not my thing. She says, it would be nice if we had that. And that's what created right there, that image all the way to the, uh, the far left is the hygiene commissary. Now there's, there's soap, there's deodorants, there's shampoo, conditioner. And the best part, it's all for free. And she, the, the most impactful thing she said to me, she says, Ralph, this was the first time I felt heard. Somebody was listening to me. She cried when she saw that. I said, this is you. The Veterans Roundtable is doing some amazing things. And our future direction is to get more grants and funding. We also want to get more equipment. And the, the, so we're a part of, we have a student club on campus called the Student Veterans of, of uh, the Student Veteran Organization, which I'm happy to report that last year, we, out of all the clubs and all the fraternities and everybody on campus, we received club of the year. So give them a round of applause for that. Hell yeah, right? I take a lot of pride in that because I'm the president of the club too. So but one of the things, we went to a, a conference, and as I shared this Veterans Roundtable idea, the other campuses were like blown away, like, I how do you guys do that? I'm thinking, you guys don't have that? They didn't even know what it was. So now that's expansion into new universities so they can have these programs. They're going to design it off of this model. And that's the, the beauty about what we do is in education is we share these ideas. I just want you guys to understand the takeaway from this, right? Telehealth, it works. Amongst the veteran population, there was a number called 22 a day, which means 22 veterans a day on average were, were committing suicide which is a horrible number. But telehealth has reduced that number to 17, which is still not an okay number, but that number's decreasing. So we know telehealth works. We need to keep advocating for telehealth resources and more funding so we can make this more accessible, more so every campus can, can get one of these programs. We all want to have collective collaborations, right? The, the more effective these collaborations with our administration, our faculty, our staff, the better our student veterans are going to be. And lastly, we need to implement the Veterans Roundtable at every place that you can. So I'm going to leave you with this. This is my last thing I'm going to say. If you don't work hard to build your dreams, someone will hire you to build theirs. Work hard, people. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you for your service. Service. Now, I have to. It is my pleasure to present Dean LeBlanc from the University of Houston downtown, who will he will share with us his insight about his internship experience. Hello. 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 Hello, everybody. Uh, hello? Hello. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm a little excited because it's my first time in Puerto Rico. So if y'all could do something for me. When I say Porto, you say Rico. Porto. Porto. When I say Porto, you say Rico. Porto. Porto. Yeah. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Much appreciated. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. So my name is Dean LeBlanc. I'm a senior from the University of Houston downtown. Um, my major is safety management, which is a bit different than most people know of. So safety is involved in everything. Uh, construction. Um, energy, power plants, manufacturing, safety is involved in all that stuff and a safety manager is someone who goes in and makes sure everyone is working safely and no one gets hurt on the job. So they come in to work and they leave the same way that same day, correct? Okay, so my project or my presentation is about my internship experience. So regarding safety management to get a job, you kind of need experience in the workforce. You know, no one wants to hire someone that doesn't know what they're doing. So internships are a great part 
or a great way for me to gain experience while I'm still in school. So when I graduate, I can, uh, okay. yeah, so internships are a great way for me to gain experience while I'm still in school. So when I graduate, I can start working and be effective like that. So my internship was with Philip 66. So Philip 66 is an oil and gas company. So some, you know, if you go to the gas station, uh, I don't know if it's popular here, but it's popular where I was. So uh, Philip 66, it's gas. So we, the refinery I was working at would refine out that gasoline. And so that gasoline was the stuff you put in your cars. Um, so Philip 66, uh, so I was in California. I am from Houston, Texas. So that's a 24 hour drive, if I was driving, which I did, uh, to LA where I was staying for the summer. So it was this summer, May 2024 to August 2024. Um, I was there for two and a half months working in a different state, knew nobody there, I had no family there, but I wanted to do that just to get out of Texas, see something different. Uh, I got tired of Texas, I'm not going to lie, but it's okay. You know, just to see something different, experience a different work, work environment, and see how things are different from comparing uh, California to Texas. And this picture you see, I was excited to be there, you know. So yeah, and the department I was in was health and safety and environmental, so that was my department. So during this internship, it was my first time in a refinery at all. So it was a lot of learning experiences, which I enjoyed. I had three projects that were mine personally that I worked on. Um, there were different intern events. So I was one of seven interns at this refinery and we had different events. As you can see here, we went to a baseball game. They had um, like bowling night, stuff like that. So it was cool things that they had for us. Um, leader presentations on this bottom right picture. This was a picture in front of when I was finished with my internship, I had to present in front of all the leaders. And that was the picture I took just to document that moment. They thought it was cool. They thought it was funny. So they were laughing, smiling in it. Um, and I had a lot of different learning experiences as well. So it was a, it was a great internship experience. So the projects I worked on, uh, one was a risk reduction and compliance project. This practically means, so when there's an incident happens, you have to report that incident into a software. And then so that software categorizes these incidents into one, two, three, or four, four being the worst kind of incident, one being uh, not that big a deal. So I went into this software and I looked at the risk rank three incidences. So the three, um, the third worst incidents, I took those and I went to see if the corrective actions on these incidences were actually imp being implemented into the field. So when something happens, people have to do something about it. And if they don't do something about it, that's a problem. So I was verifying if people were actually doing things to correct incidences and prevent them from happening going forward. And so my second project I did was two gap analyses. So gap analysis is there's a corporate standard which the whole company follows and then there's site specific standards which the site follows. So each site is different so each site has different site specific standards. But all site specific standards have to meet the corporate standard. So I was comparing the corporate standard to our site specific standard and seeing if there were any gaps in the, in the site specific standard. And so for my third project was a non closed loop sour sample station. So in a refinery, you have to take samples from, I'm gonna call them faucets because that's the best thing to refer them to. There's faucets that you have to take samples from. These samples go to a lab and they're tested to see if they're up to grade or if they're not up to grade. Uh, so when you take a sample, sometimes there is toxic gases that are released when you take a sample. So 
when that happens, it's a non-closed loop system. And so my project was to identify the non-closed loop system so we can eventually make them closed loop systems and no one is harmed or exposed to these vaporous gas, these toxic gases when they take a sample. So I was identifying that. So three different projects are working. So lessons learned. There, are, there, are, there's a, so much to learn just about the refining industry or the industry of your choosing, but so much there's very little time there. So I was there for ten weeks. I'm gonna say six of those weeks, I still didn't know what I was doing because every there, as you can see from the picture, there's so many pipes. There's so many things going on, so many lights and buttons and sounds and stuff, so you don't know what's going on. So it took a while for me to try to learn everywhere as much as I needed to, um, and there was little time. So by the time I got a hang of everything, there was two weeks left, and I needed to wrap everything up, and then I was gone the very next two weeks. So there's a lot to learn. Uh, also, one thing I learned is building relationships. So... I went in there with an open mind, um, the building relationships with the people that are next to you, the people that I reported to, and the people that possibly could report to me. So everyone, so safety is about the people, and the only way to ensure everyone's safety is if you are building relationships, and that's why it's easier for me to protect the people that are working at this company, right? Also, building relationships, everyone is pretty open, um, especially when you're new to a company or you're an intern, everyone is willing to help you and share things with you. So building relationships is, is a good way for getting people to help you without them knowing you're helping, you're helping, they're helping you, if you get what I mean, yeah, okay. Also, uh, embrace change. So as I said, I lived in Houston, Texas. I've only lived or I've only lived in Houston, Texas, and I moved across the country kind of to L.A. by myself. Um, I was staying there by myself, had to do all the adult things by myself. Right. Uh, and so that was that was a change for me. It was new for me. But I enjoyed that. I wanted to seek that opportunity because you never know what you're capable of unless you put yourself in a different environment or an environment where there is a possibility or room for growth. Also, accepting feedback. So accepting feedback is, is a great way to... Accepting feedback is about your mindset. So if... if if I have a terrible mindset and someone tells me, hey, Dean, your presentation is too long, I'm going to be like, no, it's not too long. Yeah, that's a terrible mindset to have, right? But if, if, if I have a great mindset, if I adjust my mindset and be like, okay, maybe I could take that into consideration, and then I accept the feedback, and then I'm able to adjust with that, and I'm able to uh, you know, implement that in a way that's beneficial for me. And the last one is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great place. LinkedIn is where I found two of my three internships that I've, that I've been a part of. The first one that I've been a part of was, I only got it because I was building relationships as well. So building relationships and LinkedIn. And so LinkedIn, I go on LinkedIn, I'm probably, you know, I'm gonna be honest. LinkedIn is where I'm at besides Instagram, okay? And so and so on LinkedIn there's this page for jobs, right? I go on that jobs page and I apply to every single job on that jobs page, okay? So yes, yes. Get on LinkedIn, okay? It's free. And I, I'm not an ambassador or nothing. They're not paying me, but they've definitely, I'm saying, nah, nah, nah. but, but yeah, uh, but in, LinkedIn has helped me a lot just for finding jobs, finding opportunities. So if, if you're interested in finding an opportunity, like an internship where you're getting paid for your work and, um, 
and you're you're able to to experience uh, a different setting uh, you know just go on LinkedIn type in what you're interested in or your your career field and uh, you know apply for jobs that way you're not gonna get all of them but you'll get one and that's that one is all you need so so thank you this was it my name is Dean uh, any questions comments concerns recipes uh, I'm here but thank you all very much Thank you, Dean. Um, before we end this session, I want to share our gratitude with everyone to be here and hear us, hear from us. And I want to ask to Dr. Pablo Rodriguez and President Nieves to join us for the exit tour of this main building and enjoy the rest of the tour. Oh, okay, in order for us to leave the premises, since we already have uh, only one elevator today, that rarely happens, but today happened. Uh, if any of you cannot use the stairs, we're going to do what, what we call the 25 cents tour, which is we go uh, down, down, downstairs, uh, like... Uh, floor by floor so that you can see what's what's going on there because in this floor we don't usually teach classes you see it's mostly offices and 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 this this big room so we're going to go downstairs and you're going to see like from the almost from the from the elevator usually but well, but since we if any of you cannot use the stairs we're going to go downstairs and we're going to spend like 2 minutes in each floor and Next time, you're going to see that we're already downstairs. It's only five floors, so uh, by the 3 p.m., we're, we're in, the, in the buses. So there, uh, you, can, you can go and, and you can use the bathroom or anything. You, we're going to go downstairs. If, any, if not, somebody cannot use the stairs, we, you're welcome to use the... the but we, we cannot all be in one... In one Okay, Dr. Pablo Rodriguez is, uh, is, the, is the head of the graduate school. He also has, is, is the director of the STEM uh, award that you see over there, the STEM, uh, PRG STEM uh, from the Department of Education. And he, in his many hats, he's also part of ICANN and, and the Internet Society. So all the techies, you can talk to him. <laughs> Greetings all, and my regards to my cutie brothers. I'm also cutie. So, awesome. What we're going to do and what I'll propose to do is we'll take the stairs, we'll go to the fourth floor, and I'm going to show you the techno zone, which is where the STEM program has this amazing room. And then, as the president mentioned, we will follow from floor to floor. And for those of you that can make it, make sure you take the elevator. So thank you. I'm gonna pick it up. Was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. 